What up, everybody? I'm going to wait for everyone to get into the room. <clears throat> it is hard. I got people here. What's up? <clears throat> God, I didn't take long at all. Um, hey, everybody. So I'm really excited today. Andrew J. Uh, yeah, Andrew J. Duffer is going to be joining us. You guys have seen his viral videos. And um, <clears throat> he always starts out his videos uh, talking to camera, sort of pacing through his apartment. And he says, what's up, fuckers? And I think that's hilarious. Hey, Jake Kaplan. So his videos have gone viral um, talking about social justice issues. And um, I believe he lives in Texas, in a small town in Texas. Um, so I'm going to bring him into the chat today because I'm really curious to find out what inspired him to get uh, this vocal in a very conservative neighborhood and what it's been like to kind of have these videos go viral. He's a white guy, but he's an ally to the black community and um, really uh, beautifully unpacked white privilege. And uh, I was just really impressed with him and uh, wanted to have a little chit chat with him. So let's see if he is in the room. Um, there he is, I'll bring him into camera now. Um, Andy's never been Andrew J. Andrew J. Duffer is his hand. Call him Andy, because I feel like I'm that close to him, but he'll correct me if I'm wrong. There you are. What's Look at up? That. <laughs> <laughs> How okay, first of all, hi. <laughs> all right. So um I think well, I think you kind of hit people's radar when I think you got a lot of traffic for our passed around video when you were pacing through your apartment talking about Trump and I mean all the things. Was that the first video you ever made and it just happened to go viral? Or have you been doing this for a while and that one just blew up? I had made other videos before, um, but nothing about like political stuff or social injustices, just like creepy men in my inbox or crazy people at the grocery store, things like that. Are you talking about me? <laughs> <laughs> Much older. <laughs> gotcha. So life experience stuff, you were basically just sharing yeah. your experiences. It's like shallow, superficial, like easy breezy, funny stuff. Mm -hmm. But. It was, I just, I got so tired of these people from my hometown. Like they had, they, um, I don't live there anymore. Okay. But when you go there, you know, they'll, they'll see me at like the grocery store or, you know, they'll, hey, how are you doing? I imagine a Piggly Wiggly. Is there a Piggly Wiggly or no? Kroger's. There used to be a Piggly Wiggly. <laughs> but, uh, uh, it's a super Walmart. Or... Oh, no. Actually, I'm not going to shit on Walmarts because I, don't, I had never really been to one and I started traveling. And I was living in Vegas and I went to the Walmart and I was like, oh, I get it. Like you could live, everything you need is there. <laughs> yeah. And there's no dress code. <laughs> right. Right. Well, there you go. Um, but, yeah, but yeah, that's where, that's where I would usually go. And, you know, they would see me and like, usually it's because they had just posted something like pro Trump. Mm -hmm. Right. To me and it caught them off guard and it's like, oh, hey, how are you doing? By the way, I, I, I like you but um, I'm voting for Trump because of, of this, not because, you know, I hate gays, but. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah. <I> was <laughs> so were you in every single video before you started tackling political stuff and social justice, were you always pacing around your place? Cause I, I love it and I'm a pacer, so I get that. I'm always pacing. Okay. All, every video I was pacing. Uh, I started doing them at work because um, I was the only employee there for the longest time. And so I had some downtime and I'm like, I'm making a video. Yeah. So <laughs> I was bored at work. Um, but yeah, now that we're busy again, I do them at home. <laughs> got it. Got it. So when the first video kind of hit and you really take some good jabs at Trump and um, just calling out, I think in a really funny, relatable way, some of the shit that, that uh, is going on in government and politics, do you, do you pre-plan what you're going to say? Or is this all like you kind of know... And it's just stream of consciousness because it's so clean. I, I'm always fumbling for words if I were to try that in one take. So, like I said, the videos that I did before they went viral, it was just a stream of consciousness because it was just me telling a story. Uh, but the five minutes of high tea video, the first one that went viral, that was a stream of consciousness. Um, I knew that I wanted to, you know, compare it to like Anne Frank and Hitler. So I knew that I wanted to say that, but everything before and after that was just a stream of consciousness. And then when it went viral, it scared the shit out of me because I was like, okay. <laughs> well, but let's talk about that though. Were you actually scared for retaliation or people trolling you or, you know? The internet is mean. So I was like, 
oh god um but i mean i knew it was gonna go viral when i saw it and it had like 70 shares and then i refreshed it five minutes later and it had 100 and this was right before i went to bed and oh i was god. like tomorrow and this is gonna go viral and it did and i just i guess what scared me is because i had no control over it people were screen recording it and downloading it and so even if i wanted to take it down it was already out there um, I mean, I knew I was probably going to get hate, but most of the feedback was pretty positive. But yeah, I was, I think I was more concerned about like, oh shit. <laughs> well, you know, and when you, when you kind of segued into the social justice issues, whether it's Black Lives Matter or talking about our own kind of privilege, whatever that looks like for each of us, I know mine, you know, I'm in some spaces, I'm very white passing. So I've that, I have the TV thing. So I get a little privileged in different areas. Um, when you kind of, I think when you tackle some of these issues, you make it so it feels funny, we can have a good laugh, but then they're also kind of thought provoking. Um, and I love the experience you recently shared in your, I think it's your last video, we talked about white privilege and you talked about your best friend. And you're like, well, I can't be, I can't be racist because my, my best friend's black, you know? Um, I just wonder if you could share a little bit of that because I, I love that story and I thought it was so beautiful how I think we've all kind of been blind to some areas in our life that we could really be focusing in on about how we are all contributing to problems. Um, well, I mean, we were super close for the longest time and we stood out like a sore thumb. I'm just like, right. I'm five foot seven. What state? Oh, you're five foot seven. That's good to know. Um, what state are you in, by the way? I don't think I even set up where I just said the South somewhere because I've read the accent. I, I'm like, oh, okay. I mean, got it. So, um, but yeah, in the time it, it's Northeast Texas, it's this small, tiny town. It's like right where Texarkana and Arca or Texas and Arkansas meet, like in the Texarkana area. Mm -hmm. Um, she was taller than me. She's like a big, beautiful woman. And so we just, we were like, we stood out like a sore thumb and people, every time they saw us, they would just always stare at us. Like we were crazy. But, and um, you'd have been friends for years before you went to that store together and you noticed something was different. And I thought that was so profound. So we had lived in the same town our entire lives and we went to school like K through 12, but it was like 10th grade year that our schedule was like identical. So we were mm -hmm. always together and we just, we got super close. Um, but I mean, I had always liked black people. I had always had black friends. I didn't care about their skin color, but like I said, it's like I grew up in this town where people are constantly saying the N word and making black jokes and acting like white people are better. And so even though I didn't care, I still, you know, I would make innocent black jokes that I thought were innocent, but I mean, and they would laugh, but I feel like on the inside, it made them feel some type of way. And like, while I had no malicious, you know, will towards them, it's like, I feel like I may have made them feel a certain way. And it's just that stupid ignorance. Like, just because you have black friends doesn't mean that you're not racist. Like racism, I feel like white people think that racism is just like, you don't like black people, but like, there's so much more. It's like an onion. Yeah. There's so many layers to it. And I feel like a lot of people only know about that one layer. And so I agree. I, I, yeah, I think there's a lot of different, there's overt, overt racism, which we recognize right away. You can clock it. And then there's like, there's a different kind of microaggressions like, well, black, yeah, but not you, you know, when anyone talks about a marginalized community, whether it's their ethnicity or their sexual orientation, gender identity, they'll be like, da, 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 and they'll say something kind of shady. And then they'll say, oh, but not you, you're not like blah, 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 you know? And <laughs> so there's all these kind of little kind of microaggressions or when people uh, meet me and uh, they'll say like, wow, you're so articulate. I'm like, no, I'm, I'm speaking eloquently, but I, you know, articulate is like, yes, I can form sentences. And, you know, it, so it's, it, there are many little things, and I think society didn't help, media didn't help. I remember growing up in a very evangelical, um, conservative household, but like we're low income, you know, and Puerto Rican, we're, we're made of the natives of the Puerto Rican island, the white Spaniards and the, and the black slaves that were brought over to the island. But I've experienced that some of the Puerto Rican folks that I grew up with within my own family were the most racist against black people. Um, and it was pretty overt when I was a kid. And when I started school like you, I had a diverse group of friends and you start to get to know people and all the old tropes you hear about whether a family or someone else had said, you're like, that doesn't track. Like I, that's not gonna be part of my belief system. But like you, I also had moments of awakening where I was like, oh yeah, that's not a great thing to say or that's not a great belief system or looking around and seeing there's a lack of diversity in a lot of entertainment spaces. You know, I was working in morning radio 
And I think they have like, you know, we started with a, a, a pretty diverse cast and now I think there's like one black person left. And it's tricky because we'd go to these meetings for all the radio stations and there'd be five out of like a hundred people um, that worked. And so you, you kind of see that certain spaces are um, not representing everyone's voice equally. And I think what that does is it certain kind of separates people. If you don't see yourself reflected for a while, they said, Black people who can't carry an action film. And then Black Panther proved that wrong in so many other instances. Um, so where you are now, are you prepared for another video? When are we going to get these? Are you feeling the pressure that we want more? Yeah, I just posted a video yesterday and the comments were like, we want another video. And I'm like, oh my God, I just, <laughs> yeah. I'm not complaining. I love that they like them. It's, uh, but I try to, I'm trying to get one out every week. I mean, mm -hmm. it's not, exactly every seven days sometimes it's like eight to ten but i try to get one out every week and yeah I try to stay, but um now that i have a, a little platform and people are listening to what i say i do put more thought into my videos and so i mean honestly it does it would take me about a week to prepare a video um yeah. I, I i find like a current event or something that's bothering me and then i just open my notes app on my phone and I just put like thoughts or jokes or anything that I have. And then, you know, after three or four days of that, I try to organize all of these thoughts. This is so smart. Script, and then I memorize it and I just hit record and go. Yeah, well, they're so good. And I think, you know, I, one of the things that really spoke to me is that, you know, you are this white guy from the South. And so people are, are looking at you a certain way. And a lot of my black friends, when this first, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement started years ago, they're like, gosh, I'm so tired of explaining the same principles over and over again to people. And now with that, we had the second wave a couple months ago and this sort of raised consciousness as a global society, everything stopped. People were more focused. The Black Lives Matter movement was getting the proper attention and being explained to people who had written it off. I think it, it kind of was so rewarding to me and also just in, um, inspiring when I attended some of the rallies. It was a lot of people that looked like you, whereas the first Black Lives Matter rallies that I attended years ago, it was a more ethnically diverse, if not, you know, white people were in the minority. But here in Los Angeles, it was like hundreds of thousands of people and many of them white saying, I don't know. I, I, I know that I've been ignorant to some things, but I'm here to listen and learn and support. Yeah, you can't. You can't, and it's hard um, when you hear it because you just, you get defensive and it's, you have to be willing to listen and open your ears. And like I said, when Black Lives Matter first came out, I did not get it. Like it went so over my head. Yeah, tell, tell me more about that. What was the first impression you had when you, when you first heard it? I know that for, for me working in media, when I would reference it, people would be like, oh, ooh, let's not get political. And I'm like, I don't even think that's political. It's literally basic equality, but when you first heard of the Black Lives Matter movement, how did it register to you? Or if it did at all, like what did you, what, what was your messaging? What, what were you being fed at that time? I was defensive. I was like, when I heard Black Lives Matter, and again, I don't have, I'm not racist and I don't care about the color of your skin, but when I heard it, I felt, oh, so my life doesn't matter. I'm not important. Don't all lives matter? Just that typical stupid, white skin response um and then like i said my friends were i was like posting about it like i would share articles and i would just like i don't get it and people were like you sound racist are you like mm. what's the Andrew? and then i was just like why in the hell is everybody calling me a racist why is everyone accusing me of being a racist <laughs> because i'm not and then i was like i looked within and i did some self-reflecting and then i talked to some of my friends and I think that helped me understand it because it's literally not saying that your life doesn't matter. It's just saying, hey, there's a lot of shit happening to black people and you're white. It doesn't affect you. You don't see it. You don't care because it's not affecting you. But then when you start to really look and listen and you see what's going on, you get it. And I think social media has helped a lot, like seeing these videos of cops That's, attacking black people. It's, and, that I think is like the one, you know, one of the things that I, 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 can only imagine how frustrating it could be as a community who has been saying this for generations, you know, centuries uh, of the um, suppression. And now it took video after video after video after video. Like we needed that 
proof, you know, and it's been happening for so long. I can understand so many people posted, I'm tired. You know, a lot of my black friends are posting, I'm tired of, of fighting for this and having it fall on deaf ears. But social media, I think, is making an impact in that way. And it's really shitty that I have to go through oppression and slavery and racism and then calmly teach the people that did this to them <laughs> how to yeah, I mean, them. <laughs> that's that I agree. And I think there's so much institutionalized racism in the way that, um, you know, so, that many different things are formed. Um, and we were even talking about it. I was talking with some of my Broadway friends on a Broadway podcast about how there's a real lack of like uh, people who get hired who happen to be black in the director space or choreographer space. Um, and so even working um, in, you know, on Broadway, most of the casting directors in New York are white. And so they're casting you if they it's an ethnic role, they're literally trying to tell you the kind of ethnic they want from you, which is also like really bizarre. Like, you know, for me, it could be like, there's like code language for, I know the kind of gay they'd like me to play. They're like, you know, I just think that he's, just have fun with it. I just think he's like really fun. Like just make him more fabulous. AKA they want me to really queen out, right? And so I have a lot of my black friends who said, you know, yeah, I don't think this song shit is that big. So like take away the soul, like, you know, all these different kind of language that people use. And we wonder, um, like people are like, are you ever moving back to New York? I'm like, yeah, when there's more Hamiltons, but like beige is really tricky to get a, a good role on Broadway, you know, so. <sighs> I know. Well, so, okay, um, are you, well, let's do just some speed, just basic questions. Are you, how old are you? Do you share your age? I'm 30. 30, fantastic. I and are you, uh, are you uh, single? Because there's 59 people watching here and I'm sure about, you know, 58 and a half want to know. Single as fuck. <laughs> <laughs> and where you live right now, how are people, how is the pandemic impacting your community? Do you have um, leg leg like rules in place where people are, are supposed to wear masks? Are they wearing masks? What's going on in your community? There well, is a mask order. You have to wear a mask. And most people are, but then there's always those people. Like just the other day, I went to Quick Trip to get gas and I ran in to get a drink and there was this woman who was just proudly walking in without a mask. I mean, she had her nose in the air and like just being so combative about it. She was just waiting for somebody to say something, but yeah, there are those people. Um, and even where I work, I put five signs on the door that you have to wear a mask and people still walk in without it. Like, yeah. I know it's so it's so incredibly frustrating. I have I don't know if you knew this about me, but I'm like obsessed with um, fish aquariums and stuff. And so I've given myself home projects to keep myself at home. I also you know, I'm not working. So um, I, I'm always nervous about money when we have these kind of like gaps in employment. But generally speaking, I can find something to do. But in this modern age, nothing. And so I'm trying to be as responsible as I can. I also have a roommate and a dog. So if God forbid we get sick, who's going to come walk the dog into a house that has COVID? You know what I mean? Like it's trying to be responsible for myself and others. I'm thankful right now that I'm not like, w like making bank because I don't know if I had a whole of this money, what would I, how would I treat the pandemic? I know I'd wear a freaking mask, but right now I'm like, I have friends who are like, let's hang out. We can socially distance like the 10 of us at a small restaurant with our masks off. I'm like, that literally makes no sense. It doesn't, it's literally like, you know, it's so I'm, I'm in the space where I'm just keeping my ass at home with hobbies and stuff. And that's what I'm doing. But I mean, if people would just follow the rules, it would be over so much quicker. We have been saying this from the beginning. I mean, this is not much has changed. You know, it's like the, the physically distancing, washing your hands and wearing a mask has been, you know, I am glad to see this administration finally taking it more seriously, obviously probably for some political gain there. But um, it's a little too little too late, you know, at this point, I think. I just, it's... It's not fun. It's an inconvenience. It's, but I mean, like you have to do it. And if you would just do it right, then it would be over so much quicker. Like just yeah. inconvenience yourself for a little bit and let's get over it. Let's, let's end it. <laughs> so I agree. So wear a mask, wash your hands, do the things, do it right. Um, if you want, what would be your message? Like if people watch your videos, what are you hoping that they take away from watching your video? I mean, cause it gave me a great laugh and I was just very, I reached out to you and I was very impressed. I mean, unfortunately, I was not the only Puerto Rican celebrity to reach out with you. Apparently, Ricky Martin wants to marry you. Fucker takes no. everything from me. 
<laughs> so let's talk about that. Were you were you surprised when Ricky Martin posted your video? Yes, I was like, what the hell? And then after I, you know, like it was fangirling about that, I realized that he had followed me. Like I didn't even realize that. And I was like, oh shit. <laughs> he yeah, got so babies, you know, I'm just saying he got babies. So, you know, just, I don't know if you're ready to have some, to be a mama to some kids. I know he got a man too. <laughs> well, all right. So again, I, I kind of skirt, skirt over that. But like, what are you hoping people get it, um, when they watch your vids? Like, what are you hoping the takeaway is? I mean, you don't have to agree with everything that I say, but you would just open your mind, and think about things and be open to the fact that what you may have been taught in history or growing up may not be right. And you're gonna have to be willing to grow and change. I, I guess what I'm asking is that you just be open-minded because like I said, not everybody is gonna agree with everything that I say, but sure. stop stop closing your mind. Stop forming an opinion and saying, that's it. Yeah, there's I agree. Like, and there's things that they go through that you aren't aware. And when they're making movements like Black Lives Matter, they're literally trying to tell you something. and. Uh, like I said, like I even had it. You have that first initial reaction where you just, nope, just listen. Yeah. Just and I, you know, I, I think you, you just touched on something really, um, I, I've been saying this like during the whole quarantine as we've been sharing um, videos and people just, you know, sharing the mic on their pages. I've gotten to really listen to so many incredible advocates for the Black Lives Matter movement and, and, um, and, and a lot of trans advocates and just really feel like I'm getting the best masterclass in the education that I was never taught. Um, and more of us need to have those kind of lessons. And when we talk about white supremacy, it's like, I know a lot about white folks' contributions as I was taught in school, but I wasn't taught except for a couple of African-American people, the contributions that they made to this country. And I, I, that actually goes for many other ethnicities as well. It's all put through the filter and the lens of this kind of white journey. Um, and so I'm really, I'm really excited about this young generation who are becoming so politically engaged, but more social justice engaged as well. You know, someone said, and I, I love this, you're lucky black people are not trying to get revenge. They just want equality. And it's like, gosh, you know, we don't need to get puffed up about the Black Lives Matter movement. If like you said, just listen, look at the facts, start looking at the incarceration rate and start looking about neighborhoods, start looking at the gerrymandering that happens with voter oppression and all those things in certain communities and really try to think, if you think that there really isn't um, oppression there, I'd be very shocked if people actually did the research if their takeaway was there is no oppression. I think people just feel a certain kind of way and that guilt of, oh my God, what have I been doing all along to contribute to this? Because I drag myself for that. There's things that I'm like, wow, you know, I could have, helped try to you know bring more people of color into this project or whatever it is for me and even like you said earlier watching being mindful of our language there was something thrown around with a coworker of mine when i worked in radio that i hated um they didn't like pc there was just like oh everything's so pc pc and i was like it's not political correctness it's literally just correct um and uh there's some things or there are communities that are crying out and when they're crying out and they're hurting it's important for us to listen yeah, and I yeah. think that make people laugh and you can grab their attention. They'll probably be more inclined to listen. But I mean, that's what I try to do is I try to make it funny because like who wants to just, I mean, it's it's deep, it's heavy and it's hard to hear. So, I mean, I try to keep it as serious and realistic, but, you know, funny at the same time. Yeah, I think you do a, a great job at that. I look forward to chatting with you again. I'm going to leave you here so I don't kill your entire afternoon. But thank you for all you're doing. Um, I'm really proud of you because I know it probably can't be easy to be posting those vids where you live. I mean, everyone who follows me on my page knows what I stand for. So it's like, I feel like sometimes occasionally I'll get a little troll in the, in the DMs. I'm like, why are you following me then? Like, shit ain't changed. And you, like, this is me. So I just want to thank you and, and great job. And by the way, if you're watching this right now, every Friday, I'm going to go live with a new guest at 1 p.m. So make sure you join us here. Andrew, thank you for popping my um, every Friday cherry. <laughs> Thanks for popping my Instagram live. And interview. <laughs> I can't believe you've never gone live on Instagram before. I ha I mean, I haven't. I <laughs> We need more of you live, please. And if you're not following Andrew, please take a minute to follow him as we end this video. Andrew, stay safe. I'll talk to you soon, okay?
Thanks. Have a great Bye. fucking day. That's right. <laughs> Bye.